Back in the day when I was playing soccer, I remember a particular a moment in which uh, we were playing in a really important playoff game. It was the game to go to the championship game. And we were facing an opponent that we respected. We, we knew there was going to be a challenge. It was going to be tough. And uh, about halfway through the game, you know, we're all geared up, right? Halfway through the game, till 0-0, zero, zero, we finally broke through and we scored. Made it one nil, as they say in soccer, one nil. Uh, then about a minute later, we scored again, making it 2-0. And then literally like right off the bat, we scored again, making it 3 nothing. And we were going nuts. We were going crazy. Like we were all geared up for this, all hyped up for this. And in this moment, we were going crazy, just celebrating, fist bumping, chest bumping, ripping our shirts off. No, we didn't do that, actually. <laughs> but it was awesome, man. We were, we were excited. In that moment, though, our goalie, who is a bit overzealous, was a bit overzealous, maybe a lot overzealous, because screaming across the field, like, running across the field with like anger in his eyes. He was like, guys, stop, stop it, calm down, get yourself together. The game isn't over. <laughs> and uh, for a long time after that, we gave him a hard time about it because we were like, dude, it's good to celebrate, right? We're up three nothing. We just scored. It's right to celebrate. As I thought about that a moment later though, I thought that, you know, in a sense, we were both kind of right. It was right to celebrate. We should celebrate, be excited. Right? We scored the goal, we're up. Strong chance that we're going to win, and we did end up winning. But he was also kind of right. right. The game wasn't completely over. We did need to stay in the moment, stay focused. In the text that we come to today, in 1 John chapter 2, John gives to us both reason for celebration and also reason to stay engaged to remember and celebrate what jesus christ has done for us what he's done in us but also to stay engaged because in a sense the battle isn't over with that would you take your bibles and go with me to first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 we're going to look together at verses 12 through 17 this morning and as you turn there be reminded that in our last two messages in 1 John, we've seen God's desire that his true children would know that, that they are his. God desires that we would be secure, that we would have assurance of our uh, place in him. So, so God does not want us to live in this life in the realm of ambiguity. Like, I'm not sure if I'm in or not. I'm not sure if when I die, I'll go to heaven or not. That's not how God desires for us to live. Rather, God desires for us to be secure. He desires for us to be sure, to have an assurance that we are, in fact, his children. And so he provides for us tests whereby we might test the authenticity of our faith. And we've seen those in the last two messages. And so for those that pass the test, for those that would say this morning, I'm confident, I'm not perfect, but I'm confident that I know Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Christ. What John does in this text is provide for us encouragement. If you're in him, you have great reason to rejoice. You have great reason to be encouraged. So let's read it together, verses 12 through 14. John says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, as you read that with me, you immediately notice a difference in style. Uh, perhaps it's even rendered differently in your Bible. Maybe it's indented in a way to set off the reality that, that John is writing in a little different format or a little, di little different style. It's more poetic here. He employs, again, parallelism here. So you notice with me uh, that it's a little different in style, but you also notice with me that it seems 
he addresses here three different categories of people. Is that true? Did you notice that as you read through the text? Three different groupings, if you will, of people, three couplets, namely children, young men, and fathers. So the question is, how should we understand this? How do we understand what's going on here? Well, there are a number of, number of different options that we could explore. Uh, perhaps, first of all, you could consider that they are literal agents. That, that John here is writing some age-specific instruction, um, counting on the fact that amongst the family of faith, amongst the body of believers, there are people of all different ages. And that's a beautiful thing, by the way. It's a beautiful thing that we enjoy here at Heritage. I'm so thankful for that. There are people here from all different ages of life. And we need each other. The older need the younger, and the younger need the older. It's a true family of faith. So perhaps this is about literal ages. A second option is that perhaps this is not literal ages, but actually stages of maturity. So John uses these categories to reflect stages of maturity and development in Christ. That the idea is there are new believers in Jesus. There are also believers who've been with Christ for some time. They've been growing in their discipleship, following him. But then there are also seasoned saints, as it were. People who have walked with Jesus for a long period of time. And again, that's a beautiful thing inside the family of faith. There should always be those categories amongst us. And praise God we have those here as well, new Christians, Christians for some time, and then those who've been Christians for a long time, mature in their faith. But then as a third category, perhaps these are all just terms of endearment, like affectionate terms of endearment that Paul uses, or John uses here, family language, children and young men and fathers to get at the fact that he loves these people. Uh, this is a family of faith. Certainly the first one, uh, rendered little children, is a term of endearment. In fact, look back with me at that, verse 12. And you'll notice with me that this term is used three times in this chapter. In chapter 2 and verse 1, also chapter 2 and verse 18. Certainly this term, perhaps set off from the others, is a term of endearment. You guys are my kids John is saying, from a pastor's heart, you're, you're my kids, you are my family. So here's what I want to say to you. I think that there are really good arguments for each of these renditions, each of these ways of understanding what John is doing here. However, I think the more important thing for our understanding this morning is to glean the message. In fact, I think that you could spend so much time diving in, seeking to decipher what these categories are, who John is precisely addressing, and miss the message. One of the reasons why I say that it's so important that we grab the message is not, not only because it's just amazing, the message is fantastic for us, but also because the message for each one of these categories, because there are categories here, the message does apply broadly. The message that John gives to young men and children and fathers applies to everyone. Uh, consider what a couple of commentators write on this point. Leon Morris puts it this way, but as all the qualities ought to be found in all believers, it is best to regard the division as a stylistic device, adding emphasis to the message. John Stott puts it this way, it is significant that in each of these six messages, the verb in each is in the perfect tense. Now, Note this next phrase, because I'm going to refer back to it a number of times. It's in the perfect tense, which indicates the present consequence of a past event. In other words, what John is writing here factors in a reality. This is true, he's saying, because of a prior reality. What John is doing is anchoring all of this in the work of Christ. This is all true, what I'm writing to you guys, is all true because of what Jesus is already done. So, Stock goes on to say, John is laying emphasis on the assured standing into which every Christian has come, whatever his stage of spiritual development. So there are categories here, but for our purposes this morning, we're going to focus now on the message, which is broadly applicable to all. And I think you guys will find great encouragement in it 
with me this morning. So what I want to say to you at this point is this. Be amazed, my friends. Be amazed. If you've passed the test, as it were, if you are confident that you are in Christ, that you know him, that you have a relationship that's real with God through Jesus, be amazed at what you have. My friends, be amazed at what you have. I think we are given here a fab five, as it were. Five statements that are just downright sweet. So uh, feel free to throw out some shouts of glory or hallelujah or amens or whatever. Number one, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. You see that in the language of verse 12. And what hope this is for us. This is common language for us that we are forgiven. But it is our hope. Amen? Amen. We cling to grace. To grace. That there is hope for us. That our guilt can be removed. That our shame can be removed. That it's true when Paul says in Romans 8, that there is now no condemnation left for you. Right on. No condemnation left for you at all. Thus your guilt is gone. Shame is silenced. Your record has been expunged. You are free, my friends. You are solidly free. Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12. He, the psalmist, praises God. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. What a blessing. We are free because of the grace that is found in Jesus Christ. So those sins that we tend to resurrect and mull over in our mind and heart and renew that guilt, renew that feeling of shame. What John is saying is, brother, sister, you're forgiven. You're forgiven today. Rejoice in that. Believe that. It's been wiped away. There's no condemnation left for you. You're free. Amen, indeed. You're forgiven, number one. Number two, verses 13 and 14, you find multiple statements that could be re reflected this way. You know the eternal God. You have come to know the eternal God. Uh, people will often say, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? This is the ultimate who you know. The ultimate. John is saying, you have come to know. I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, think about it. If you are in Christ, you have come to know God. You've come to know the one who is from the beginning, who did not have a beginning, who sits outside of time, this supreme Awesome, magnificent God. You know him. You know him. You have a relationship with him. And by the way, again, this is language that reflects intimacy. Okay, this is not like saying that I know about Tiger Woods or Tom Cruise or Michael Buble. This is like saying I know my dad. I know my wife. I know my husband. It's that kind of knowledge, that kind of intimacy. So how phenomenal is this? It is truly remarkable for us. You have come to know God. What a privilege. You've come to know him. Number three, you can see this in the language of verse 14. You are strong. You are strong. You're forgiven. You know the eternal God, but thirdly, you are strong. Now, again, I refer back to uh, Stott's quote to help us be reminded that this is rooted in something that's already happened. It's rooted in a past action on the part of Christ. So what John is referring to is not our human strength. Very interesting, as this certainly relates to the category of young men, right? 
For young men are often enamored with strength. But John is helping us to see, not that it's natural, but rather it's supernatural. It's the strength that God provides. Um, young men are often synonymous with strength in a way that I think is helpful for us to think about in this text. Uh, you don't have to teach little kids, right, especially little boys, to flex their guns. Isn't that true? You don't even have to teach them that, all little boys. You're already seeing the picture. Okay, that, that's from a little video. It's one of our favorite videos. Little Dylan, he's like two years old, is chucking, you know, the bags in the cornhole. He got wind of the fact or sense that I was videotaping him, and without any coaching whatsoever, he looks up at the camera and just immediately, boom, flexes the guns. You don't have to teach that, right? Little boys, especially, enamored with strength. They want to feel their dad's muscles, even if their dad does, doesn't really have a whole lot <laughs> going on. They love that, right? And there with strength. But John is helping us understand, even in the language, this is not your strength. It's not your strength. This is a strength that God provides. It's rooted in the strength of another. This is about the Holy Spirit of God that has been placed within the heart and life of every believer to endow everyone, not just young men, but everyone with strength. I think the language here is indicative of what you find at the end of Isaiah 40. When in the end of Isaiah 40, what, what does Isaiah say? Even the young men will grow faint and weary. Even the young men will wear out. But, but, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. This is not our strength, my friends. John is reminding us that we are strong, strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? We're strong in his strength. So you are forgiven. You know the eternal God. You are strong. Fourthly, you have the word of God in you. Notice with me in verse 14 how quickly John ties his statement about their strength to the word of God. You are strong and and you have the word of God in you. Perhaps the premier text to talk about what the word of God provides for us is 2 Timothy chapter 3. And here, in fact, there is a relationship again to youth. But as for you, Paul writes to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able, that with me the power of the word of God, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. What a rich blessing it is, my friends, to be able to look at the counsel of God's word, to be able to draw from the wisdom and instruction of God. So John reminds us, my friends, and again, this is reason for celebration. You have the word of God in you. It's with you and it's in you. And then finally, number five, verses 13 and 14, two statements that state, you have overcome the evil one. You have overcome the evil one. In Christ, Satan has been defeated. So in every superhero movie, what do you have? You have either the introduction or the reintroduction of some sort of despicable villain. Isn't that true? And the whole movie sort of builds to a climactic moment in which Eventually, the superhero uh, faces off for a final time with the supervillain, and the superhero wins, right? Whole cities might be destroyed in the process, but the superhero is going to win. That battle, my friends, doesn't take place early on, does it? It doesn't take place like 10 minutes into the movie. Am I right? Otherwise, that would be a really short or a really boring movie. Because you don't pay you know, the price of admission to go in and watch people like walking peacefully on the streets. 
You like to walk peacefully on the streets, but you want to watch a movie where there's carnage everywhere, right? And the drama is building to that climactic moment. No, like this moment happens towards the end. In the last 10, 15 minutes of the movie, it resolves. The last 10, 15 minutes of the movie, then you find people walking on the suddenly cleaned up streets of these cities that were just minutes before totally laid waste. Everybody is good now, right? Because the superhero is won. What's the point? My friends, understand, we are, be excited, my friends, we are in the last 10, 15 minutes of the movie. You guys with me? We're in the last little bit. Like the ultimate climactic battle has happened. It has happened. Now, let me be very clear. There is a climactic battle yet to come. But it's not going to be much of a battle. If you're tracking with me, Jesus is going to win with a word. He's going to show back up, and the forces of evil are going to meet him, and he's going to win with a word. It's not going to be drama, unless you're just on the king's side going, yes, that's phenomenal, that's exciting, right? Because justice is going to be had. Evil is going to be wiped away. But it's not going to be much of a battle. Why? Because... The battle's already happened when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and there he took the wrath of God for our sin and then was laid in a tomb. Three days later, he came up out of the tomb victorious over sin, victorious over death, victorious over hell. He's won, my friends. The serpent's head is crushed. He, he's still doing his thing, but not with ultimate freedom. Not with ultimate freedom. Jesus has won. And if you are in him, you're on the victor's side. If you are in Christ, John says, you have overcome the evil one. That's phenomenal. Is it not? That's phenomenal. So think about these things. Be amazed, my friends. Be amazed. You are forgiven. You know the eternal God. You know him. You are strong in the grace that he provides. You have the word of God in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Why? Because we have a great Savior. Hallelujah, Hallelujah indeed. We have a great Savior. So John wants to encourage us this morning to be amazed. Be amazed. But he switches gears, verse 15. He switches gears here in an important way. Verse 15, we find that there's a sense in which the battle isn't done. The battle isn't over. So kind of like my overzealous goalie years ago, John comes in at this point to say, but guys, stay engaged. Guys, sit up, suit up, stay engaged. Let's read it together, verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world, John says, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So the battle is not done for you. The question is, what is the nature of this battle? What is the nature of this conflict? Why does John have such passion to say, stay engaged, brothers and sisters, stay engaged? Well, it has to do with an understanding of God's continuing mission to redeem. So in this last 10, 15 minutes of God's movie, as it were, God is doing stuff. He's doing really important things, and he's using you in the process. My friends, he's using you in the process. God is on a mission to redeem a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language, and he's doing that now. Isn't that wonderful? And he's also using you in that process. He desires to use you and I to be witnesses, to be uh, a testimony of what Jesus has done in us, to shine the light of his gospel. So God is on a mission to bring glory to himself by redeeming a people for himself. He's doing that now. 
And this is happening in this last 10, 15 minutes of his theater, of his movie. So, question, how does Satan want to interrupt that? Satan wants to interrupt that by robbing you of your joy, brothers and sisters, robbing you of your joy, and therefore robbing you of your influence, robbing you of the light that God desires to shine through you. And so Satan, my friends, though he is defeated, his head is crushed, he's still at work. He's still desirous to rob God of glory and to rob you of the joy that God wants you to experience in him. So John issues this command. It's with that in mind that John issues this command. What is it? Verse 15. Do not, brothers and sisters, do not love the world. Don't love the world. Don't give your affections and your heart to the world. Now, what does he mean by that? Let me just pause here and give a couple of clarifications right off the top. John is not telling us to not love people. This is not a contradiction of John 3.16. It could sound like that, for in John 3.16, he says, God so loved the world, so loved the world that he gave. God is not telling us to hate the world, i.e. to hate people. Secondly, understand that God is not anti-culture. Okay? He's not anti-culture. He doesn't mean that you can't be fashionable, like this morning. That you can't enjoy a good movie or uh, be a, a big fan of the Huskers. He's not saying that. I think for a long time in my life, I sort of understood it that way. Like, if I loved the world, I would, or if I loved God instead of the world, I had to like, not wear American Eagle, right? Or listen to Michael Buble. Something like that. God is not anti-culture. So what is this about? When he says, John says, do not love the world. Well, what John is saying here in using the language of the world is he's talking broadly about the philosophies of the world. A system, a system at play, really guided by Satan himself and his minions, a system that stands in opposition to God in opposition to God and his word and everything that God would stand for. These are philosophies. These are ideologies that stand opposed to God. So the question is, how do these things impact us? Well, Satan, essentially what he does is set baited traps for us everywhere that will prey upon our flesh. That prey upon our flesh for... The lusts that are given here, you see it here in this text, the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, these are all really in us. It's a part of our sin nature. We are not glorified yet. We still battle. If you're honest this morning, you know we still battle with our sinful flesh. This is all in us. So what does Satan do? What Satan does is he sets traps for us. They try to sort of lure us away from the love, care, protection of the Father. When I was a youth pastor in Virginia, one of the things that we would do often is for like VBS or um, special Sunday school things, stuff like that, we would often take our church van down to these apartment complexes that we tried to minister in. And uh, we would round up kids, all right? There were kids there that we knew that, we, that, would, that would come if we came and picked them up. And so often I would take a couple teenagers with me. I would drive with a good youth pastor, our van. Now let me tell you just really quickly about our van. Our van was totally ghetto. I mean, it was beat up. There was rust everywhere. Literally, when, when you open the sliding doors, this little 15-passenger van, you open the sliding door, it would fall off its tracks. It looked terrible. Terrible testimony. But that was our church van, and that's what I drove. So imagine that van pulling up to this apartment complex. There's all these kids and parents just standing there kind of waiting. And we wanted to make it fun, so we had like bags of candy and stuff. And this, this rusty, like broken down door comes sliding open. And this teenage girl in our youth group named Sam, she was super enthusiastic. She just leans out the door. She doesn't even get out. She just leans out the door and goes, hey kids, come get some candy. 
literally what happened. <laughs> and immediately it just sort of hit me like, that looks terrible. <laughs> Here's this Grace Memorial Baptist Church man abducting kids. <laughs> it's okay. In a sense, this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to lure us away with sugar-coated poison, lure us away from the Father to literally abduct us, as it were, in the present, away from the Father, to rob us of joy and to rob us of the light that God wants to shine through us. That's what he does. He preys upon our flesh. What are these desires? The desires of the flesh. These are passions. These are appetites. Within us, many of them holy and good, holy and right, but what Satan will do is try to lure you away from having them fulfilled in a God-ordained way and to seek to fulfill them outside of God's design, outside of God's plan, the desires of the flesh. Secondly, the desires of the eyes. You know by experience that the eyes are the windows to the mind and windows to the soul. So Satan is like a master advertiser who will just dangle things in front of us, constantly dangle things in front of us, seeking to make them look good, to draw our heart away, to draw our mind away, to allow our minds to just be constantly enamored with the things of this world, to go down particular paths and for our affections to follow, away from God, away from his word, and towards the world, towards things that are opposed to him. So many examples in the Old Testament with regard to this. Achan, perhaps you will remember, Joshua chapter 7, he saw, he looked, he says when he confessed his sin to Joshua, I saw the spoil. And it's like he couldn't resist it. He began to think of himself with those garments on and all that gold and what I could do with it and the prominence and the prestige. And he saw it and he took it, even though he knew it was forbidden. David saw Bathsheba. And he went after her and he took her. He knew it was wrong. But through the eye gate, as it preyed upon his natural flesh, they sin and their hearts go away from God. It's not surprising that their hearts grow cold. Their hearts are dull to the things of God and dull to his spirit. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and then the pride of life. This is simply the temptation to boast, the temptation to boast in who I am and what I've accomplished and all the resources that I have. Look at me. It's an insatiable desire to impress other people. And we've never had in society, in the history of men, we've never had a better venue for this one than social media. Look at me. I'm going to impress everyone with my presence, my looks, my stuff, my status, who I know. All about impressing other people. What John says is Satan will set it up to draw your heart away in these ways. To draw your affections away. With regard to the pride of life, someone well said, few people need voice lessons to sing their own praises. It's so true, my friend, so true. We need to guard our hearts. For these desires, again, are all within us. We're all there, and the world is bombarding us with its message. Consider what one commentator writes when he says it this way. In our age filled with advertising, rock stars, supermodels, and celebrities, it's not an overstatement to say that if worldliness means living only to please our flesh, and pursue what our eyes lust after so that we can arrogantly boast about our conquests and accomplishments, then worldliness is a synonym for America. It's just where we live. It's, it's the air we breathe. It's there. So we must be careful, my friends. We must be careful what we imbibe, what we allow to influence our mind and our heart. We're in the thick of it all the time. Thus John says, be engaged, brothers and sisters. Don't be asleep. Be engaged. Be alert. Be alert. Satan, with 
sugar-coated poison is trying to draw you away from the Father. Draw you away from true joy, true fulfillment, and draw you away from being used by God to make great impact for His glory in our world. Now, as we move towards conclusion, notice with me how John grounds his appeal in this text. Really important. Note with me how he grounds his appeal. Verse 15. First he says, worldliness is incompatible. It's incompatible. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See that very clear contrast? You're not going after both at the same time. If someone loves the world, if their affections are wrapped up with here, they're not loving God. James actually says it more bluntly. When he says this, friendship with the world, James chapter 4 and verse 4, friendship with the world is hatred towards God. You're not, you're not doing both. So John is saying, you need to pay attention. Brothers and sisters, sit up, wake up, pay attention. Worldliness is incompatible with God. Think about the philosophies of society. I found this chart and studying this week, and I thought I'd share a couple of these with you. A clear distinction between the category of what would, what would fall underneath love of Father and love of the world. First of all, the love of the world. The focus is on me, as opposed to the things of the Father, the focus is on God. The things of the world, make as much money as possible. Things of the Father, give as much money away as possible. Things of the world, live comfortably. Things of the Father, life is not fundamentally about comfort. Things of the world, make a name for yourself. Things of the Father, make his name great. Things of the world, stay married as long as your spouse meets your needs. Things of the Father, serve your spouse the way Christ modeled servanthood and choose to love him or her for life. Things of the world, teach your children to love themselves and seek self-fulfillment. The love of the Father, teach your children to love and obey God. You see how distinct it is? And these messages on this left-hand side of the world, they're everywhere. Everywhere. You have to have a filter, my friends. Be alert. Be watchful. Worldliness is incompatible with God. But then, secondly, is it going to be a word of the day? All right? Word of the day for you? Worldliness is ephemeral. Okay, I didn't know this word before this week. I'll admit it. But I like words. So I was studying, or I was looking at synonyms to fleeting. That, that's what I was thinking, fleeting. And I found this word, and I thought, that's a phenomenal word. It's from the Greek, which literally means lasting a day. Lasting a day. In fact, the scientific word for the mayfly is essentially ephemeral. It's this word. So if you don't know anything about the mayfly, let me tell you about it. It's fascinating. The mayfly... They live for like six hours, typically. It's true. In fact, if you look, look it up, okay? You don't believe me? Look it up. Google it, but later. All right, track with me just for a minute or two longer. They literally, here's their lifespan. They hatch, they mature, they mate, they die. <laughs> In like six hours. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It's like, choo, choo, choo. they're done. Okay? It's that short. Would you know with me your text, verse 17? The world is passing away. It's like lasting a day. It's like the mayfly. It seems long to us. It seems long to us. But in comparison to eternity, it's like a blip on the screen. The world is passing away. It appears and it's gone. But... Whoever does the will of God abides forever. Think about it, my friends. Where do you want to invest? Where are you investing? Investing all of your affections and all of your energies into this world is like investing in Blockbuster or Bell Bottoms right now. Or investing in landlines or dial-up internet. Like, not a wise deal, right? Not a wise deal. It's already passed or passing away. That's what it's like. Don't invest there. Don't invest your heart, your time, 
your resources, your energy is all here. It's passing away. But rather, invest in eternity. Invest in God. Give your heart, your affections to the things of God. This, my friends, is lasting forever. It's lasting forever. Why? Because Jesus has overcome. Amen? Amen. Jesus has already overcome. So, this morning, we're so blessed. Wouldn't you agree, my friends? We're so blessed. So blessed to be in Christ. And the blessings are rich, verses 12 to 14. But we also must stay engaged. Be amazed, but stay engaged. Satan is trying to rob you of your joy and rob you of your influence. Don't let him. Don't let him. Evaluate your your life. Give your heart, give your affections to him. They last forever. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for helping us to understand your word. And I pray that you would help us to apply it. These things are easier to say than they are to apply. So I pray that you would help us to love you, to give our heart to you, to surround our minds and surround our hearts with things that will draw us to you and not away. In Jesus' name, amen.